Hello, good morning, dear friends. Today, May 24th, has started the 74th assembly of the WHO and is going to address important challenges that humanity is facing given the current pandemic in the world, the distribution of vaccines, and all that in the context of a very acute global crisis. In parallel to this uh, assembly, it's been organized the first uh, assembly of uh, civil society in the world. We are today with Dr. Carlos Ferreira and uh, very well-known doctor uh, that works in Argentina. Uh, he's an epidemiologist and uh, he has uh, worked uh, in international spheres uh, representing Argentina in many meetings and also working in the field in the over 40 countries in the, the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, always uh, defending public health and uh, how health relates with the environment. So thank you very much, Dr. Carlos Barretos, for being with us. Thank you very much, Juana, and my greetings to Presenza for the very important task you develop at a global level. Thank you very much. So the first question is a must. So we are in the COVID-19 pandemic with vaccines and very precarious primary health systems and uh, tourism also uh, people seeking for the vaccine. And so what is it at stake in this the WHO assembly? Truth is that what we know the reality of the world in terms of this pandemic, when we see the importance of the role of the United Nations in protecting the future in sense of not only human beings, but the planet as a whole, we must be aware that in this assembly, the 74th World Health Organization Assembly, what's at stake are key issues, such as the future of our species, not only in terms of the health of the population, because the pandemic, aside from having produced huge damage to health and life, it has also produced irreparable damage to the world's economy that we have only now started seeing the first hints of, and we'll need to see along the next decade, well, what we'll, we'll have to do to face this. And that's what will be discussed, it's what's at stake between now and next week. The health ministers of the entire world will be meeting here. And these discussions have an essential importance in terms of building the future. And if the necessary issues aren't discussed, even though we might have offers of resources or of allocation of vaccines, I think it will be a great waste of time. What I mean to say is that the decisions that we don't come to in the following seven days will mark the world for the next few decades. What are these important decisions about? Essentially, it's the clearly World Health Organization, its structure, and I'm not mentioning here specific individuals, people who I respect a lot, they're very committed to health and to humanity as a whole, but what I can see is that the organization as such, did not measure up to the situation to confront the pandemic in the sense of the response. It was not the immediate response we needed in terms of not being able to confront the pandemic with the necessary technology. And from the very beginning of the pandemic, the data, the 
epidemiological data which we needed to confront the situation, the personal protection equipment we needed, the doctors and nurses needed, the ambulance drivers, the public officials in charge of confronting the pandemic 24-7, and even when it came to the medication necessary for the treatment of ICU patients and the topic of protecting the health of workers that have been directly damaged, not only in in terms of their own health, physical health, but also the death rates, the impact this has had on workers and health professionals is, is enormous. But aside from that, the issue of the vaccine. Clearly, there were immense mistakes made in terms of preparation and the distribution, making available what science, the scientific community worked at so hard so that we had this solution. They will not prevent the disease, but they will reduce the death rates. And what we see now is a great apartheid in terms of how the vaccine is distributed. And as a doctor, epidemiologist, and a citizen, I am gravely concerned because it shows the failure to organize and it shows the greed, the search for profit, which is not what should today be at the center of the agenda of human beings, people who want to make a profit with the vaccines opposed to everything that we as human beings want for this planet. And I think the World Health Organization needs to confront this in a deep assessment of the failures made, the mistakes made. And so in this assembly, there are certain essential points we citizens want to get into, civil society actors in general. First of all, to acknowledge mistakes so that we find a way to solve them. Number two, to find the priorities today. Priorities are clearly about how health systems worldwide must be organized appropriately and how we contain the epidemic, the pandemic. And this needs to take place at the level of primary attention. It makes no sense to organize this focusing on hospitals, which are not available everywhere in the world. So we will not confront the pandemic by ventilators and strengthening the intensive care units, that is not a reasonable process. And thirdly, very clearly, the accessibility to the vaccines worldwide, if decisions aren't taken that ensure in the next trimester that the vaccines are made available in enough numbers for the poor, sectors of the world who have no access to the vaccine right now, if that is not ensured, then we will be we will be favoring the further action of the pandemic in these areas of the world, and the virus will see itself strengthened due to our own mistakes and failures. So in that sense, the assembly has the obligation of confronting these issues. Aside from the other points of the agenda of the organization, but these are the things that need to be debated as a result of the decisions taken here. And in that sense, we have no time to waste. Speaking about vaccines, on the one hand, the countries uh, of uh, the UN or members of the UN uh, have expressed uh, to be in favor of a waiver on the, the vaccines. And immediately, the big pharma companies uh, really of opposed. So, having these uh, two positions that are so different. So 
what the WHO could do in these regards? Well, the World Health Assembly is a very powerful institution, very powerful body. It includes the health ministry of the member states. We're talking about 196 countries. These are the people who have in their countries the possibility to draft public policy, the possibility to finance and contribute to the development and distribution of the vaccine. So in that sense, it is a body with a lot of power. To think, if we are to think that in this pandemic, only the private sector will solve the issue, I believe that is oversimplifying the situation. And this responds to a neoliberal ideology that has been very harmful to the WHO. I believe states need to take these decisions, and they can, of course, do that. Considering their alliances with the private sector, the world has multiple experiences that, depending on states being more or less powerful, or their economic condition, or even countries in a dire blockade, such as Cuba, they are able still to solve the situation producing their own vaccine. However, with the virus genome, this makes it possible for everyone to have the formula so that governments with this formula be able to work developing vaccines while at the same time the legal issues are being worked on. This is about quick, concrete decisions that must be taken. We can have, of course, an emergency response and to give to the ministers the capacity to work with a vaccine formula and also ask the producers to help them produce them. It's not just about having the formula in the end. It's about having the capacity to produce it, the technical capacity, because, uh, again, human resources are very important. So the World Health Organization has this capacity and this information and can distribute it. But of course, this is not possible right now because there is a frame, a legal context that is established by the World Trade Organization. As I see it, we have been in a pandemic ever since January last year. It's been now almost 17 months of pandemic. And I think that having lacked a coordination to solve the pandemic means and shows an incredible failure of the UN system that human beings, that we as humans cannot allow ourselves to withstand. We cannot allow our grandparents and parents or children or workers to die because they have no vaccine. And this is what should dominate in the thoughts and the decisions of the ministers who are present in this assembly. We must do advocacy work in this sense, and that is the goal of our participation here. Ministers will be the main responsible of what happens if the vaccine doesn't reach the people who need it in a reasonably frame of time to prevent the pandemic to extend in time beyond 2023. We, we must know at every delay of the operations of controlling the pandemic makes the virus even stronger. And that's one of the problems. That's one of the things that we need to understand we need to know to understand why there's an urgency and if we must coordinate different permits from the legal aspect, 
then we must make the decision to start walking along this path while at the same time we work on the legal aspect. But we cannot wait three, four or five more months until we ensure the waiver of the patents only due to a problem of inconsistency in the United Nations structure. So those are the topics that are going to be addressed during the 74th Assembly of the WHO. And uh, so who are going to participate in this assembly? How are they going to work? Well, this first people's assembly, which will be parallel to the World Health Organization in parallel, because aside from discussing the issues of a work agenda that I will share with you in a minute, we also want to be informed by the debate happening in the World Health Organization's assembly so that we can analyze the process and be alert to what's happening there and what will happen after the assembly. Here, as I said at the beginning, the world will have hope or not, depending on what happens in the next seven days. And after that, we have the post-assembly where a decision will have been taken in favor of life. And in that case, we will walk down one path. And if that's not the case, the situation will be very different. And in that sense, civil society has a lot to share. So we will work based on the program that we have agreed in the consortium of citizens and organizations that have organized ourselves in this assembly at different levels. First, we have the state level, and there are several activities organized analyzing health ministers and ministries and seeing how they've worked at the national level to see what their actions have been, the response they've had when confronting the pandemic. There's a series of guests that have been health ministers in different parts of the world, um, mostly the Spanish speaking and also European world. We have ministers, ex ministers from Spain, from Argentina, Chile, Ecuador, Paraguay. They will be analyzing them this reality based on what happened, what influenced health ministers or prevented them to come to the correct decision or action. And for example, why was the focus taken out of primary health attention? And there was a decision taken to strengthen hospitals, which is fine. But in fact, if we analyze, for example, the Latin American region with a strong influx of resources for primary attention, then today, May 24th, the situation would have been much different. We see today that in the large cities, people die on the streets because there are no more beds in the hospitals. And when they cannot withstand the impact of the disease, they walk from their house to the hospitals and die. This is a completely unethical, and immoral situation, which we cannot simply withstand. We cannot naturalize, we cannot simply take this as without replying, without acting against this. If there had been primary attention for these patients, they would have had someone at home, a nurse, a medic, there would have been more oxygen measuring devices that would have prevent this lack of beds in hospitals. So again, this will be discussed in the presence of many former ministers. And we'll also analyze the other component of this, which is that most of the countries worldwide did not 
analyze this pandemic. This pandemic was not acted upon from the parliaments. They should have been the ones who, through a law and a legislative process, prepared society to confront the economic damage. A guiding plan at the level of national governments would have ensured the capacity to contain the impact of this pandemic, which everywhere multiply the model of the US and of Brazil with Bolsonaro saying that this was just a small little flu. It was nothing serious and that one had to ensure the finances of society and the economic functioning. This was a grave mistake. Parliaments were not active as soon as they should have been. And we'll also analyze the role of health of the health sector, the private sector, and universities in large areas of the world, many people who acted to contain the pandemic were medics who were specialists in microbiology or in different areas that little have to do with the study of epidemics and collective health and public health. And this happened in many different countries of the world, mainly in Latin America. It was these people who controlled the public policies put in place by the governments. So we will be analyzing then why epidemiology as an area of knowledge was absent from this process. After that, we'll analyze the impact of the decisions that were taken, some of them taken too late, despite the fact that in the epidemiology from the very beginning mentioned the impact of the older population. We know now what the situation was in China, in Italy, in Spain, the number of older people who has died I am, for example, I'm a doctor with 40 years of experience, and I was in the, I was there on the territory in Indonesia where the tsunami hit, and still I never saw this. And even though in the fact of Indonesia, there was also an armed conflict at the, at the moment, but still never saw how this attacked directly the group of older adults. And this is something that we also saw in Argentina, in Chile. We'll be analyzing then this process and the impact of the disease in terms of the clustering of the disease in the families. Because here, most of the mechanisms of contagion had to do with the family and the workplace. So this tells us a lot about how absent epidemiology was as a, an area of knowledge that could have shared information with us. We've also seen an unacceptable number of deaths from the health sector, workers from the health sectors, essential workers. We had here also a key difference. Certain countries of the world decided to quickly work to protect these workers and vaccinate them. And in many other countries of the world, this isn't even mentioned right now. So we will be working closely with unions from the European world, the Latin American and North American regions of the world. And then we'll talk about the impact in terms of human rights, forms and the protocols that have been developed from 
the very limited guidelines that were published from the World Health Organization. We'll also mention the necessary tools to confront the pandemic, not only mentioning the vaccine, there have also been very serious problems in terms of missing medication and technology for the treatment of patients, even personal protection equipment. Last year, in March, there was even sequestering of planes, and it was very clearly proven that there was a very poor organization in terms of ensuring the protection of workers. So all of these issues will be analyzed and also to see which mechanisms will make it possible to come to a decision with the urgency the world requires in the short term. And this needs to be done very clearly. As we heard from President Biden, he said we must waiver patents, and he says that while still having hundreds of vaccine doses, that if they have been delivered on time, they would have prevented the huge mortality rate that has spiked right now in Latin America. So saying right now we will waive patents, it's just empty words right now. It's not the politically strong message that should be shared so that stakeholders of multinational companies that have made an enormous profit, which is very concerning for me. So the World Health Organization needs to publish a statement recording according to this, saying that it is not ethical to make a profit on vaccine. Most of health ministers are doctors, and I believe they must understand. Every doctor in the World Health Organization must understand that it's not ethical to make a profit on vaccines and on the lives of people, and that should be the key point of humankind to confront the interests of greed, the greed of the CEOs of pharmaceutical companies. It's a serious problem. Sometimes I compare these people even with the CEOs of the arms and weapons industry. So from that point of view, we will analyze all of these aspects in the conference, Juana, and you are all very very much invited. We'll have also a space to have to discuss the role of journalists, of the media, the role also of universities and faculties and different social actors in the face of this pandemic. So, in the current situation, and what uh, the people can do, so you have mentioned different sectors and that, that related uh, to different kinds of answers to the epidemic, uh, uh, as doctors, as the university that can also give the point of view of different specialists. But what people can do in this context? Well, I'll say something that I learned during my professional work. I had the possibility to work with the United Nations organization to organize a response to the reality of the organization of the United Nations due to the fact that their decisions don't actually reach society. Many of the decisions taken and recommendations that are published and sent to governments remain there sequesters in the spheres of the offices and headquarters 
of the UN, for example. Now, with the pandemic, there were many, many meetings of technicians that said the pandemic was coming. And these documents are lying there in the basements of the UN, and no one gave them, paid them any mind. And when they reached the government, the same thing was true. So very quickly, I agreed with the statement saying that the recommendations of the UN were good for nothing unless every citizen took them on as their own. So that means there should be a direct connection between the UN and every citizen everywhere. So this was mentioned then, the importance of creating this parallel fora, parallel to the events organized by the UN agencies. And another element I want to share here with you is that really the World Health Organization, everyone tries to say that it's that it's entirely technical. But, and yes, it might be that there are technical elements, but it is mainly political and the pandemic has proven this. It is about organizing global politics and should act accordingly. Because as a technical body, the organisms of the member states will never give it the space and the meaning it should have. That's one first element. This, in, of course, involves other issues. For example, it'd be very interesting if the World Health Organization had a director general voted by everyone worldwide people instead of having having it selected by health ministers who themselves are not voted by people but just appointed so then we need to talk about who will be representing our opinions and our point of view clearly being a technical director general when confronting a disease can help in terms of the knowledge at hand but as a political body the world health organization did not take the political decisions that were needed to prevent the development that we saw afterwards so to answer the question then every citizen worldwide every person suffering of the pandemic should know that their opinion is very important. That their opinion, when it comes to what's happening, is very important. And precisely the fact of not having a voice makes this citizen role invisible, just as was proven. For example, I was general secretary of the parallel forum of civil society in the assembly of the population uh, aging that happened in Madrid. So we had the United Nations Assembly with all of the delegates. Here we're talking about the ministers of uh, social development from different countries, parliamentaries, businessmen. But aside from that, we decided to meet and draft an action plan. This was approved parallel to the assembly. And it also entered into the agenda of government delegates. And they approved it. So, again, essentially, the action of the United Nations is political, it's not technical. So in that sense, it needs, WHO needs to become a political, into a political body, and uh, citizenship should be involved. And that's why we're involving citizens in this People's Assembly, not Carlos Ferreira as the doctor, but as a citizen, just as you could participate, Juana, not as a journalist, but as a person, because you have parents and children, and you are concerned with what's happening in the world. And this concern needs to bring us together and strengthen us so that the, those responsible take on 
our voices and the messages that we share and include that in the decisions made. Right now, for example, we need to have vaccines available urgently. We cannot wait three months. We cannot wait until the WTO comes to a consensus decision. We know that these decisions in these imperfect democracies we have are almost impossible or are crafted in such a way to never come to pass. So it's very possible the WTO never comes to a decision regarding patents and the waiver. So that's why it's very important. First, the WHO comes to the correct decision in political terms, imposing this on all of the member states of the UN, and that the health ministers should publish a very strong statement against the huge profit made by pharmaceutical companies, stating that this is immoral and unethical. If these two resolutions aren't taken, I believe that from June 2nd onwards, we will have a very different world. And if the assembly does come to these decisions, the situation will be much better going forward. So to finalize, we will be having debates as citizens, workers, leaders, students, journalists, so that our voices are heard by the health ministers who are part of the assembly, but also to the media and the world as a whole. Because if we do not act now, June 2nd will be too late. Do you think that humanity is going to be able, or in this case, uh, the WHO will choose uh, to defend life? Well, yes, I do think so. I firmly believe that every health minister, every public official has a, let's say, a pro-humanity spirit. I don't see them as people with the greed that we can find in the CEO of a multinational company. So I make a distinction here between a health minister and a businessman from the pharmaceutical company. Because I have the experience, for example, of having fought against tobacco industries, and there was, at the time, an enormous, an enormous number of stakeholders there. And now here, what we have is the connection between the pharmaceutical company, chemistry, and weaponry industry. These are different lines of uh, economic development that has taken place in the last 20 years of the world. And it has changed the course of history. Again, I've participated in about 20 World Health Organization assemblies, be it as a member, as a deputy, or civil society participant. And every time that I think about the WHO in the 70s, talking about the strategy of primary attention and everything that meant for the world to ensure access to health services, people from every neighborhood and far off areas of the world where medical practice was where health was brought closer to the people and far away from the shopping centers of hospitals. Every time that I think about having participated as one of the members of the doctors that worked for the Ottawa Declaration approved in the 80s, saying that the model of economic development supporting based on fossil fuels and food produced by these companies that they, these companies that produce junk food and producing therefore obesity, 
obesity. All of this is so far from this WHO of 2021. I believe we are, the conditions are given for us to go back to the tradition. Many of the ministries there today know of the importance of primary care and agree with what was stated in the letter of Ottawa. So I think, again, that the Assembly has the possibility to have this debate. We'll see what happens. I know that they've had a lot of problems in the last 20 years. I know the configuration has changed. There are financing issues, which has also meant finding finance sources that are unethical. It's not right that private companies or foundations that are quasi-private sectors, quasi-part of the private sectors, are in charge of providing resources for the functioning of the WHO, which should be not only technical, but a political body. Thank you very much. So we're speaking about a change of the WHO and uh, the United Nations uh, and uh, a change uh, of the direction of uh, the system of humanity. So as you said, uh, to start deciding based on the ethics. And also to choose from the perspective of survival, Juana, because the UN is a structure that, of course, must be modified as well. But it's had great successes and has grown a lot. We have, for example, the declaration of climate change. And despite all of the lobby that tries to contain its activity, it has been talking about the seriousness of the situation that we're living in right now for already 20 years or more. So we do have negationists and people who, due to their economic interests, talk about denying climate change. And despite that, the UN remains steadfast in its stance. And we know that if you don't change the model of economic development based on a polluting system that produces death and disease in the extractivist and pillaging of natural resources, destroying life itself. For example, as happened in the Amazons or in the water, if the world doesn't change this configuration, we will have very serious problems. So that is the other issue that must be debated in the assembly, the number, the 74th health assembly, the issue of the urgency to confront climate change, just like this pandemic has been a consequence of the close confinement of humans together with the viruses of animals, the destruction of forests in China, and a virus going from one species to another. This all has to do with climate change. And I, as a doctor, have always said that health is the human face of climate change. If we don't see that the only way to be healthy is to struggle for environmental protection, for nature's protection, and for a harmonious relationship between human beings and nature, and moving away from this idea of exploitation and being at war with nature, doctors should be the main environmental activists. And that's why, but this, what I mean is that that's why I think that the doctors who are today being the faces of the struggle for the future in this assembly, they should also be very aware that health is the human face of climate change, and we need to protect health. 
I think the United Nations has made great progress in terms of peace and health, but there where it had a weak spot is when it comes to transforming the model of economic development, the world is set on fossil fuels, extractivism, mining, intensive agriculture, and the overconsumption that is doing so much damage to humanity. The Paris Treaty, which is, in my opinion, a public health treaty, is about making it effective and we have only 10 years so in if in 10 years we do not modify our energetic model and i'm talking about argentina you know in argentina if our government decided to use instead of fossil fuels instead of Vaca Muerta, uh, space of fracking, where the highest amount of damages have happened due to the pandemic. There is a very high rate of deaths in health sector workers, one of the main spots for fracking in the country. So instead of using Vaca Muerta, instead of carbon, we chose solar energy, which in Argentina has a potential for immense strength. In five years, we could transform generation, the production of electricity there where we live and the places where we produce by using clean energy. And what about the wind energy? Clean energy, again, or the strength of weights. We have one of the largest costs. So why not make the most of it? Or what about our rivers? All of this energy that could be produced clean is not an interest for the actionists of private companies because they cannot own the sun. They cannot charge us for using the sun or for using the wind. And so I think this is a decision that the Argentinian government should come to, and just as in Argentina, also in other places of the world, because precisely there where we have more capacity for um, solar energy or wind energy is in the poor countries of the world. The countries where we have less sun is in the north, is in Europe, rich countries. So this is a very important moment. And I wish also that the World Health Organization in this 74th Assembly also come to a very clear stance of confronting climate change. And we'll see if it happens. Let's hope so. And uh, let's hope that they decide uh, to defend. Thank you very much. Thank you very Juana. much.